Okay, great. So, yeah, so my name is Sultan Hassan. Um, so in the beginning, I would like just to organize, like to, to recognize the organizers for the great uh, efforts that they made for this. So please, let's just give them, give them a big round of applause for this amazing um, workshop because it's been great. So I, uh, so yeah, so um, I am at uh, NYU. Um, so this is a project I started here um, 10 days back. Um, so I don't have much of uh, results to show, so I will change my talk, but I will talk about it also at the end. Very, um, um, at the end, so I will talk about um, some of my greatest hits in generative models. So, so I will talk about two, like um, uh, several uh, projects that they. It's only I'm interested in large scale, so we don't need to motivate this, right? Like all these up upcoming experiments, and I like generative models. Um, so let's start uh, talking about this. So, so the first one is led by uh, my student uh, in South Africa, Musima, which, uh, which is an archive today, actually. It's been recently accepted to the ICLR. Uh, so the, the basic idea, can we really emulate radi radiative transfer on large scales? Uh, because I'm also interested in really reionization. Um, so let's see the picture, right? So what is the general picture here? Um, um, so this is most of the reionization simulation works like that, like, and we always want to speed them. So you, you have the density field, um, you run the, you, you, uh, most of these codes just they run grid based. Uh, you try to find sources on the fly with your favorite method. Um, and then after that you apply any, uh, radiative transfer scheme. This way is just approximated, but you can also do the full radiative transfer. But we have, we know, we know in the field that like if you apply these approximated models, uh, they give some similar morphology to the large scale picture anyway. So, and this step is very, 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 very expensive. And if we want to do enable inference at the field level, when we have this future observation, we need to speed up this. If we are able to go from minutes to seconds or and so on, then we can really generate maps when we have these large scales um, much more easy, right? Um, so, um, so how do we do this? Uh, well, so you can do a unit, so that's a standard unit. I don't need to uh, show an architecture. You can do anything, but what is amazing here is that you can train the, the unit in two different methods. So the first one is deterministic, which means that you, you go from the density field directly to the ionized field. This is actually a very hard problem because you are really going from a smooth field to a highly nonlinear field. Um, so that's a de deterministic mo uh, model. The second one is the denoising unit, uh, which basically you can have the density field, and then you plug in an extra channel to the density field, which could be a white noise, or a noisy version of your ionized field during training. So wh while you, wh when you do your training, um, you alternate. At each step, sometimes you plug in a white noise uh, next to the density field, and sometimes you plug in like a noisy version of your ionized field. So the hope is that during training, you, the network could see uh, some uh, features of the ionized field, right? Um, so when, you, when it comes to testing this model, first one is easy, right? So it's because it's deterministic, but this model actually has like infinite solution to the same, uh, to, to the same inputs, right? Um, so what is the testing protocol you can do here? Well, you can, uh, when you do the testing, right, you plug in your density field, and then you start only with white noise. So you don't need to plug in the noisy versions because this is how you make it denoising. Um, and then the result out of that, you, you iterate again. So you, you plug the results, which is this one here in the second iteration, and you plug it with the density field again, and then you, you basically recurrently uh, recycle your um, output into the network. And as you see, as you go through different steps, uh, you see that your ionized bubbles really grow over time. And this way you can really detect uh, the edges of the ionized bubbles very, very nicely. And, and then you can just compare with this. In this uh, method, we realize we need that core iteration, but you can go more if you have different uh, realization. Um, so this is just like the, uh, to show the results. So this is the density field, this ionization field. Uh, this is model one, which is the deterministic one. This is the probabilistic one. And as you see here, if you compare like ionization field and the, the, the truth uh, versus the model two, you get very close even at the, at, at the level of the power spectrum. As you see here, you get really a very uh, nice uh, agreement with the power spectrum. So that's very nice. Um, so this method only just like applied to ionization field, I think you can really apply it to any um, uh, different methods, um, uh, different data sets. So the second one also, I, I wanted to talk about an attempt 
uh, to do uh, non-Gaussian generative models, and it's probably uh, opposite to what Dahlia was saying about science about compression. I think uh, uh, it's also about decompression, which is to generate images. Um, so, um, so this is just a method. Okay, so it's the same ionization field, right? So this is the direction for the simulation, right? You go from density field to the ionization field, but how about we go about this through the summary statistic, right? So can we really find summary statistics um, that we can use to speed up the simulation, right? And if you have really optimal summary statistics that capture most of the information, uh, then you should be able to sample from them and get a larger realization. Um, so the basic idea for this work is that you can start with the density field, you compute your summary statistics, so this work has been led by, by uh, uh, you hang in uh, Minnesota. Uh, so the basic idea is that you calculate your power, uh, summary statistic, you move your summary statistics to the similar, like the corresponding summary statistic of the ionization field, which is you can easily do with ML, you can do anything, so we, don't, we are not really worried about this step. I think the step we are really worried about is sampling, right? So given a summary statistic, whether it's a power spectrum or anything, can we really sample and get the fields from that? And if we can, then we can really speed most of these simulations, right? So how do we do this? Uh, we need summary statistics, so we try the power spectrum, but we also try the wavelet scattering transform, which is one of the most like uh, optimal summary statistics now we you know in the field. Um, so br just briefly to mention what they are, so what you do basically, they capture, like this uh, wavelet scattering transform, they capture non-Gaussianities, and you can think about it, them like, um, like a CNN without training, right? So you, you have fixed filters, you, you choose, you decide what filters you want to use, uh, whether it's oriented or, 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 or not like uh, spherical or harmonics or anything, and then you convolve your field with these filters, and then you apply your nonlinear activation function, which is basically the absolute uh, magnitude, um, and then you sum the field. And if you apply for each filter you apply, after you sum the field, you get one coefficient, and then you apply different, several coefficients, uh, several filters that are resulting in different coefficients. And this is here the paper also, you won by Cheng, you won in this paper, which shows that like how the, the, the scattering coefficients, they are really similar to the, like the first order coefficient, similar to the uh, power spectrum, but then you can get more information if you do the second order um, scattering if you apply two different filters in different angles and different scales. Um, so we tried these two, and then we wanted to see which one works. Well, so let's see. So how do we sample, right? So how do we sample the new realization? And I think this is also, as I said, most of this technique could be applied to different data set. So the first thing is that you, 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 you wanted to sample this map. So you, first of all, you obtain your favorite summary statistics. So we tried two different ones, the power spectrum and the wavelet scattering transform, the wavelet phase harmonics. Um, and then you can generate a white noise, which you see here in the initial step. Right? And then you obtain the same summary statistic that you want. Um, and then you try, this is, the, then you have two summary statistics you want to minimize through this loss function, right? And then you basically try to deform your white noise iteratively, uh, in order to arrive to the, to the same, to the same, um, um, input you want, right? So the, the first row here is for the power spectrum. You see that as it, it, uh, through iteration, the signal is coming out because you're trying just to optimize the, the power spectrum of this white noise to get closer to the input, right? So then you deform this and the signal goes. But if you look here, between redshift of 20 to 100, they are exactly the same. So there is no really much of information. So like once you arrive to the power spectrum, you can't really get more. But with the wavelet scattering transform, you see there is a huge difference between 20 and iteration 100 because they like they capture much more information than than the power spectrum, right? And just to motivate this, um, we show here just the, the, the last results um, that this is one of the inputs. This is the power spectrum, which has like 90 coefficients. Uh, the wavelet uh, phase harmonic about like almost 4,000 coefficients. This is another uh, wavelet. Um, and then you see here you are able to sample, and this is also a probabilistic model because you start from a white noise. So each time you sample new realization, and if you get closer to the to the input, if you compare all of them at the level of the power spectrum, they're kind of the same. Um, but another metric we used, which is the bubble statistic, you could really ask the question, what is the distribution of bubbles at, at a given radius? 
and you compute that and you see like most of the wavelet scattering transform, uh, they really give you the same distribution of bubbles as um, uh, as compared to the power spectrum, which really fails about this. So, so with this just paper, we argue that you can really um, sample large scale fields or any fields you want if you are able to really capture the summary statistic of them. Or, and also like we know that most of the experiments coming, they want to just focus on the board, like the summary statistics. So if you are able to use that, then uh, we have a way to uh, to speed up the calculation. Um, so the third one I wanted to talk about, which is um, recently done by uh, my collaborator in South Africa, um, it's about invertible mapping between fields in camels. Um, and the basic idea here is that, um, let me just show here. So the basic idea, right, so we have, you know, like there is multi uh, messenger surveys coming, right? And the aim is that given if you have a map of H1 or anything, can you convert it to magnetic field? Can you convert it to other initial line? Can you, can you move between fields, right? So this is like the dark matter. So we tried like dark matter to H1, um, um, dark matter to magnetic field and so on. And the basic idea you can do this, one of the models you can do is cycle GAN. Um, so briefly, the cycle GAN, how it works is that you have, uh, you have X and Y, you want to move between X and Y. Um, you should have two generators, so one generator G that move, maps X to Y, and generator uh, F maps Y to X. Then you have two discriminators, one uh, discriminates between X, uh, the real X and the one that you get through the mapping F and the other discriminator that is uh, discriminated between Y which is the other the other one you get from applying the G, right? And this is just the loss function which is just the normal two GAN uh, loss functions. Then you have the identity loss which is basically comparing what you get from X's in one iteration and and the cycle GAN which is the other loss where you you go from X to Y and then you back to X and then you see whether you can really get the same answer. So you try to optimize all these in the same, in the same time. Um, so let's see. Um, so this is the results, what we get. So, um, so this is here the first row about going from H1 to uh, magnetic field. The second one, dark matter to H1. The third one is dark matter to magnetic fields. Uh, the first one is the input, this is the target Y, and this is the predicted. So we really are able to really predict the same fields from like a magnetic field from H1, uh, dark matter, uh, like H1 from dark matter, or magnetic field from dark matter. And you see the fields are quite different in the camels, right? But, uh, but we are able to really convert fields much, much nicely. Um, you can look at this uh, at the level of the uh, summary statistics. So what you can do, these are like the, the PDF. So you can take a thousand images from your camel simulation. You can calculate all the BDF, just the normal histogram. And, and then you can see what is the mean histogram out of these 1000. And this is what is plotted in the solid line. And the shaded area is just like what is the standard deviation in this 1000 images you get from, from the simulation, right? Uh, and what you see here, we have a remarkable agreement in all both ways. So in the first row here, if you go just one, cycle, which means that from uh, dark, like you just convert one time um, from either magnetic field to dark matter and so on. But the, 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 the bottom row, which is interesting, is that you go from dark matter to, um, to magnetic field and then you go back to dark matter again and then you want to see whether you can really recover that, which really we can recover um, nicely all the statistics. I think uh, at the level of the PDF, but what you see here is that we don't really capture this part, but this is also just biased because these regions are usually the high dense regions, which they are very rare, so it's very much hard to, to capture. You can look also at the level of the power spectrum, and we have really remarkable agreement uh, as the same thing. You have a thousand images from camels, a thousand images generated from your model. You look, you calculate all the power spectrum, you have a big cable, then you just look for uh, what is the mean power spectrum and the standard deviation as a function of the K mode. Um, and then you see in all cases we really um, capture this very nicely, right? So, so I think um, this is really nice, which shows that like we have a method now that if you have fields, any field for any purpose, like uh, uh, these upcoming multi messenger surveys, we can really uh, make cross correlations between different surveys. We can really map things much quickly, which is which is really amazing. Um, the last one is what I started here, which is um, about diffusion models. Um, I don't have much of time to go into details, but uh, let me start by 
trying to motivate this, right? So why, why diffusion models, right? Like why, why I'm really interested in this, right? So just on uh, CIFAR 10 alone, which is a data set, right? It's a very tricky data set. You have airplane, you have bird, you have cats, you have, you have so many different things. And on CIFAR 10 alone, the diffusion models, like they are the best model ever in generative model, in generating images, they are three out of the first five diffusion models, different variants of them, and they are the six out of the first 10. So if you look at the table here, if you look at this link, which is papers with code, which gives you the benchmarking between different models, uh, diffusion models really like, it's like the first 10, there is six out of them, they really different variants of diffusion models, right? So why diffusion models, right? Um, so then, why diffusion models? We know DALI, right? And we know ChatGPT. You can ask Joe about this. It's addictive. And, right? So, but also, do they really work all the time? So this is one of the things that is, I, I really like to show, which is I did ask DALI to generate the cosmic microwave background. Yeah? And this is the result. Boom. So, so what you see, so what you see is that, um, right? So can you really say this is really working or not working? Well, what I can say is that, um, what I can say it really works, right? Because if you bring an artist with the zero physics and you ask them to draw the cosmic microwave background, will do the same, right? So I think, I don't think this is like a, a problem of the model, but I think it's, uh, it's the knowledge and the things that you give it to the model, right? So, um, so let's start. So, um, so what I have been doing is that I'm interested in these score-based diffusion models because they give you also access to a likelihood uh, that you can compute. Um, and the basic idea for these models is that you, you, you basically you have your signal that you have in the image and you try to add noise slowly to that image till you, it gets completely noisy. Um, and then after that with this forward approach and the way you do this is that is just like with this simple equation you have the F is they usually call the drift uh, parameter. Uh, and then you have this DW, which is just uh, like a Brownian motion of these. Uh, uh, you, uh, gives you this uh, stochastic, uh, stochasticity between uh, w when you sample the noise. And you just add noise slowly till completely it gets very noisy. Then you try to separate this noise very slowly, very slowly till you get back through this. And this is how the score comes because this is here uh, the, the way, the reverse way, and in this reverse way you have, this is the derivative basically of your, uh, you can learn actually the derivative of your prior from when you go back. So, um, so, so yeah, so I tried H1 maps again from camels, and I'm getting there, so this is, I started only t, uh, 10 days back, but I have a question for you now, which one you, uh, you think is the camels here? Right? Left, nobody says left. Right, left. Huh? Oh, that's some important information for you. <laughs> uh, this is six. Which one? Left or right? Left, left, left right, okay. So this is actually, um, yeah, so I call my model H1 diffuse, so if you have a better name, tell me. Um, but, uh, but this is the camels and this is the diffuse uh, model I have. But I mean, it's amazing, right? I mean, like, just like, a, this is not even a training for a long time. This is a train, I think, for uh, maybe, I don't know, like um, an hour or so. Um, and I'm getting this result, which is really amazing. It looks right. But let's look at the summary statistic, which you might not really like. Um, so at the level of the summary statistic, again, this is in the right. This is the BDF. Um, the histograms, this is the power spectrum. Again, you generate a thousand images from camels, you calculate all the histogram, you look at the mean and the standard deviation, and the same for the power spectrum. But you look here at the mean BDF, I'm, I'm kind of getting really close to the right answer. What is surprising to me, while I'm getting really close to the right answer in the BDF, I'm not really getting the same shape of the power spectrum. And I don't know why, if you are expert in diffusion models, uh, let's talk. Um, but, uh, but, but I mean, it's, it's not really, I, I think it's really something, uh, with more training and more tuning the parameters. I think I get there because like, I, I don't know like why I'm really capturing. One of the things surprises me that I know people talk about the PDF should be more sensitive to the skewness of the field and it should capture somehow much more of the higher order statistics. Whereas the power spectrum should be an easy thing to recover, but I don't know why. So uh, I'm just experimenting with this. This is the great thing we have in this workshop is that I just started this 10 days back. And I leave you with my summary. Thank you very much.
Hey, uh, Sudan, a, a great talk. So uh, we actually look into the diffusion like models quite um, extensively uh, for the last few months. So one thing that like you might want to try to tweak is the uh, guide, uh, like the guidance. Uh, it play a big role. So um, yeah, we can talk more about that. Yeah, 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 yeah. sure. Yeah, thanks, Sultan. Um, just to follow up on the last project as well, you know, let's say that you you do manage to you know tweak the guidance and get your diffusion model to to you know generate camels fields. You know, what then? What 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 do you do with it to get science? Is it the score function that you're ultimately interested in, or what's what's the goal? I think it's mainly like if I if I am I'm I'm mainly interested in the inference at the field level. And if I am able to condition the generation of the images with, with parameters, um, then the hope is that you might be able to generate images much faster than the camels. And then maybe if you capture the same fields, you can use them to do inference at the field level, like with any, any model you want. They give you also this access for the prior, so you can really um, calculate that. So you have access to the prior and the likelihood at the same time. You can do that. The only problem with these diffusion models is that they are a bit slower than other models. So like if you do a GAN or you do normalizing flows or you do something else, you might be much faster. But if you are interested about the tiny details of the image and the image generation, nothing so far, this is the state of the art, nothing really beats them. So, um, and I was just hoping to see like, if I do this, then I have other models which I did for, with normalizing flows or something, then we want to see if we can go to higher order statistic, can we really capture the same, uh, um, uh, much more than the power spectrum. So yeah, so I think that's the aim. Thank you. Sure. Hi, Chris Lovell. Um, you showed in, the, I think it's the third project, All right. this, this mapping between different fields. Have you tried, you know, using these sort of, dark matter maps to actually you know, translate between different simulation hydro codes. So you could go from H1 map in Illustrious and then say, okay, given the same initial conditions, what's the same H1 map would have been if you'd run it with Simba, for example? Yeah, no, no, I think this is only on TNG from, from, uh, from the camels, uh, but that's a great project, let's do it. <laughs> I think this is a great idea to, to, to go between different simulation, but uh, I don't know, yeah. I think different simulation it might not work, I don't know, because they are completely different, um, unless you mix the data set together, which I don't, I, don't, I don't know, because like, if you look at the temperature fields, or I know, I know these baryonic fields, they are completely different. Um, uh, but yeah, but maybe H1 and dark matter might be the same, I don't know. Um, if they have the same, uh, photo ionization background, maybe they can really have the same thing. So, but but they also have different backgrounds. So, but I think that's a great um, idea. We should do it. Okay, uh, Dalia Baron, thank you very much for the talk. I also had a question about this. Uh, you said at some point that uh, you can then take this and convert one observable field to a different observable field. Um, so can you give a bit more details about this? What type of fields are observed? What will you convert to what? How this will be changed to fit observations? Yeah, yeah, I, see, I think so far. So this is just a proof of the method that works, but, but if you think about, um, I'm mainly interested in high redshift, right? So, so if you think about like the future intensity mapping surveys, right, like C2, um, uh, CO, right, uh, for this intensity mapping with the upcoming experiment, like SPEREX or like um, Execlaim or all these experiments, um, you can easily do that for all these emissions. It's also a Lyman alpha, right? So if you have Lyman alpha emission, you have C2, you have all these emission line on larger scales, you might be able to move between fields much, much, much quickly, right? Especially if you have, a, if you are in a regime where you have this experiment, only predicts the H1, let's say, or the Lyman alpha, right? But then you want to see the correlation between different experiments, right? So then you can convert that to different uh, using your model, right? Uh, but then we don't have this, like we don't have the systematic uncertainty here, right? So we don't have any, st any instrumental effect that we add to these images yet, right? But if you, you need to, to make some efforts to add all the uh, noise level, right? Like the thermal noise, the field of view, the, the angular resolution. So you need to make this as realistic as you can, and then you do it, but as a proof concept, at the starter, it seems to be working at the level of the 
PDF and the power spectrum, we didn't really test like higher order statistics like wavelet scattering transforms or like pi spectra or something. But so far, if you care only about the PDF and you care about the power spectrum, um, we have a very efficient way to do this much quicker than the camels. And we can get this much quicker. You can really study correlation between different fields. So uh, this is the application that I think about. If you have a experiment, give you lime and alpha. Um, if you want to cross-correlate with the other experiment, I can really generate C2 quickly. I can generate different fields, but just like this is a proof of method. Yeah, sure. yeah. Uh, really cool stuff. Um, have you, could you do something like this, or have you thought about trying to do something like this, but instead of going between camel sims, going from something like particle mesh or something that's really fast to run to something like camels so that you can... Well, that's a great project. Let's do it. So, so, <laughs> so, so, no, I mean, this is just like, yeah, but that's a great idea. Um, um, we haven't really tried to, yeah, so this is so far just a proof of concept. But the, the nice thing about this, this is extremely fast. You can really, once you have the model generated, you can run it in your Jupyter notebook. And this is a high dimension field, so it's really, um, it's really fast when you have it. Um, That you can run now particle mesh in like a second. So you could then, if you could then do really fast transformation to other fields, then you could get approximate fields in a second. That's right. That's right. Cool. Yeah, that's a great idea. Thanks. Do you, I don't think we have any questions on Zoom. Um, okay. Happy. Time for coffee. All right. Yeah, Thank you. Let's thank all the speakers again.